Let's take a look at horn clauses. In predicate logic, an atomic formula has the shape P of T1 and so on up to Tn, where P is a predicate symbol and each Tk is a term. For example, M of x is an atomic formula. And P of x, F of y is also an atomic formula. But P of x implies M of x is not an atomic formula because it uses the binary connective right arrow. And a literal is either an atomic formula, which is called a positive literal, or the negation of an atomic formula, which is called a negative literal. For example, not m of x is a negative literal and therefore a literal. And a clause is a disjunction of literals. That is, a clause has the form L1 or L2 or and so on or Ln, where each Lk is a literal. And now the point. A horn clause is a clause with at most one positive literal. And horn clauses are named after the logician Alfred Horn. And we distinguish different types of horn clauses because a horn clause has at most one positive literal. So there can be either no or one positive literal and zero or more negative literals. And depending on this, we call a horn clause a definite clause, which means a horn clause with exactly one positive literal, or a unit clause, that is a special case of a definite clause, namely a definite clause with no negative literal. So in other words, a unit clause is a horn clause that is comprised of a single positive literal, or a goal clause, that is a horn clause with no positive literal. So let's consider definite clauses in more detail. And to repeat, a definite clause is a horn clause that has exactly one positive literal. And we can read definite clauses as rules of the form if implies then. Because a definite clause has the shape H or not G1 or not G2 or and so on or not Gn. And the single positive literal H is called the head of the clause and the rest is called the body of the clause. And we can write this equivalently as H or not. And then the conjunction G1 and G2 and and so on and Gn. And further using the fact that A or not B is semantically equivalent to B implies A, we can write this clause equivalently as an implication. The conjunction G1 and G2 and and so on and Gn implies H. So actually instead of if implies then, we have now written this equivalently as then is implied by if, which of course means exactly the same thing. So we can read a definite clause as if the body holds, then the head holds. And horn clauses are the basic building blocks of Prolog programs. Prolog uses colon dash as an SK transliteration of left arrow and comma for end. And in Prolog, the language elements closely correspond to the three types of horn clauses. But in Prolog, they are called rules. A rule has the shape H colon dash G1, comma, G2, comma, and so on, comma, Gn. And each Gi is called a goal. Then facts, which consist of only the head. So a fact can be regarded as a rule where the body is true. So the head always holds. And queries, written as colon dash, followed by one or more goals. And we can think of a query as a question that asks, is the conjunction of these goals a logical consequence of the given prolog program? And to emphasize this, a query is often written with a question mark instead of a colon. And we can use horn clauses for programming because we can write horn clauses that express what holds and what follows from what. And we can ask for logical consequences of these clauses. And 
At first sight, this way of programming may appear exceptional. But in a sense, all programming is of this kind. Because as programmers, we build a theory of our domains of interest. And the consequences of a program must be aligned with the intended situation. And one paper I highly recommend about this topic is Programming as Theory Building by Peter Nau, because it argues this point very well. And of course, when we program in a logic programming language like Pollock, then this strong connection between programming and theory building is particularly evident, because in Pollock, we literally build a theory and we ask the Pollock system for logical consequences of the rules and facts we state. Now, an important question is, of course, how expressive is this? That is, what can we formulate with horn clauses? And it turns out that horn clauses are a Turing-complete subset of first-order predicate logic. This is important because this means that horn clauses, and therefore also prolog programs, are sufficient to express all known computations. So let's show Turing completeness of horn clauses. We can do this by describing a Turing machine with horn clauses. So first of all, what is a Turing machine? Well, a Turing machine consists of a set Q of states, an initial state, a final state QF, a tape alphabet gamma, and a transition function delta which is a mapping from the current state and the symbol under the tape head to the next state, a symbol that is written at the current position and L or R indicating how to move the tape head on the understanding that the tape extends indefinitely in both directions. So delta is a function from state and symbol to state, symbol, and L or R. And this may look very simple at first, but this formalism in fact suffices to express all computations that are currently known. And in fact, it's widely believed that every mechanical computation can be expressed with Turing machines. So we can in fact use the expressive power of this mechanism as a definition of what we mean when we say that something is computable. For example, everything that a modern computer can do can also be modeled in this way. And this mechanism can also express its own workings. That is, we can write a Turing machine that takes the description of a Turing machine as input and performs the calculations that that machine would perform in a given situation. So let's consider an example. Here is a Turing machine that computes addition in unary encoding. This means that a natural number n is represented by n ones. So this is a Turing machine with five states. S1 is the initial state and S5 is the final state. And this Turing machine computes the sum of two natural numbers on the tape and it replaces the initial tape content by that sum. For example, let's consider what this machine does if the initial tape content is 2 plus 1, represented in unary encoding. That is, we have two ones in a row to represent the natural number 2, then a plus symbol, and then one one to represent the number 1. So in this case, the machine computes 2 plus 1. And it does that by moving the tape head to the right until it encounters a plus symbol. And then it replaces the plus by a 1 and it moves the tape head further right until it encounters a blank symbol. And when it encounters a blank symbol, it goes back to the left, it replaces the rightmost one with a blank symbol and then it moves the tape head to the initial position. And in this case, the machine has reached state S5, which is the final state. 
and we say that the machine holds. And when the machine holds, the remaining tape content is called the output or result of the computation. So in this case, we see that the machine has successfully computed two plus one and written the result three on the tape. And the important point is that we can write Turing machines for all computations that are known. So for example, we can write a Turing machine that computes multiplication or computes the factorial of an integer or sorts integers or determines whether an integer is a prime number and so on. So we can express every known computation in terms of this mechanism. And a mechanism is called Turing complete if it can also achieve this generality or in fact also express the workings of a Turing machine. And this is the case for horn clauses. So horn clauses are Turing complete and we can prove this by showing how we can express a Turing machine in terms of horn clauses. And to do this, let's use a predicate T of Q, L and R, which shall be true if and only if Q is the current state of the machine, L is the tape content that extends to the left of the tape head, and R is the tape content that extends to the right of the tape head. We can represent tape contents in any direction as compound terms like a dot b dot c and so on. Now regarding the transition function, suppose for example that we have a transition function delta where a machine that is in state q0 and encounters the symbol a goes to state q1, writes b and moves the tape head to the right. Then we can express this transition as an implication. If the machine is in state Q0 and so on, then it goes to state Q1, writes B, and moves the tape head to the right. So we can express movements of the tape head by using suitable terms to denote the tape content and by describing relations between states and tape contents before and after a transition. And this also applies more generally. If we want to describe in a declarative way anything that changes over time, then we define a relation between states. One state before the change and one after the change. And if we adopt the convention that we write universal quantification implicitly, then this is a definite clause and therefore a horn clause. So we omit universal quantifiers and adopt the convention that they are implicit. And other transitions can be modeled completely analogously. So in total, this shows that a Turing machine can be modeled as a conjunction of horn clauses. And the statement, the machine reaches its final state, that is, it holds, can also be expressed as a logical formula, namely there exists tape content such that the machine reaches QF, the final state. And this sentence is a logical consequence of the clauses that model the Turing machine and by the completeness theorem, therefore derivable from them, if and only if the machine holds. And the negation of this statement namely the machine doesn't hold, is even a horn clause. So this is a horn clause without a positive literal, so a goal. Now, if we add this clause to the horn clauses that model the Turing machine, then the entire set of clauses is unsatisfiable if and only if the Turing machine holds. And famously, determining whether a Turing machine holds is only semi-decidable, not decidable. So we know from these considerations that unsatisfiability of first order horn clauses is also only semi-decidable, not decidable. Because if the conjunction is unsatisfiable, we can refute it, that is, prove its negation. But every such procedure must either yield wrong results or won't terminate in some cases if the conjunction is in fact satisfiable, because otherwise we could use such a procedure as an algorithm that 
always correctly decides the halting problem, which is known to be only semi-decidable. And as a corollary, we also know from these considerations that satisfiability of first order horn clauses is not even semi-decidable. So satisfiability is truly undecidable. Because if satisfiability were also semi-decidable, that is, if we had a procedure that correctly answers every yes instance, then we could run both methods in parallel. That is, we could in parallel try to show that the set of horn clauses is unsatisfiable and at the same time try to find a model. And if both were semi-decidable, then this would guarantee that one of them succeeds because it can only be unsatisfiable or have a model. And this would again imply that we could solve the halting problem, which is known to be only semi-decidable, not decidable. And the reason for this difference between satisfiability and unsatisfiability is that there are sets of horn clauses that are satisfiable, but which have no finite model, only infinite models. So even if a model exists, we may not be able to construct one with only a finite number of steps. Whereas if the conjunction of clauses is unsatisfiable, then the negation is valid and by the completeness theorem, therefore provable. And this means that we only have to systematically search for a proof and if a proof exists, then we will find it because a proof is finite. So um, you may have a question at this point and the question may be, why do we care about horn clauses? And we've now seen two essential characteristics of horn clauses. First, they have a simple structure. And second, they are general enough to express all computations. Well, of course, the second property is important if we want to write general programs. And the first property is important because syntactic simplicity allows fast inference algorithms. So a key attraction of horn clauses is that they strike a nice balance between expressiveness and efficiency. And Prolog benefits from this exact balance. Prolog lets us write short programs that are general and efficient. And in addition, due to the close connection between Prolog and logic, we can reason logically about Prolog programs. And this makes pure Prolog code also easy to understand, explain and debug. And we've seen from the Turing machine example that horn clauses are in fact quite convenient a mechanism because it was quite easy to model how a Turing machine works in horn clauses, while at the same time retaining this simple syntactic structure. 